I now look to Gisela Stewart to close the case for the opposition. Thank you, Mr. President. I was quite frankly intrigued and surprised and probably in equal measure to be asked to be here today. Because you see, my name is Gisela Stewart. Now, Gisela is not a very common English name, but I can tell you it's an exceptionally common German name of someone born in the 1950s. And I, indeed, I was born in Germany in the 1950s, and I came to England in 1974, when this country was almost bankrupt. I find it extraordinary to hear early on about saying that in 1940, this country wasn't, wasn't bankrupt. Even in 1970, there was Germany in the throes of the economic miracle supported by the Marshall Fund. Food rationing continued in England much longer than it did in Germany. The, the Queen, when she got married, had closed coupons. You didn't have them on the continent. So let's just not forget about history here, because history matters. T.S. Eliot tells us, people without history cannot redeem itself. And I think we should look a little bit at history. Because what does a foreigner like me, and it is quite extraordinary that these days uh, it is perfectly all right to tell me as a German to go back home, to say all kinds of things to me as a German, because it's all right to say it to a German. So let's just be a bit sort of equal about how we hurl abuse at people. We shouldn't do it to any of them. So let me look at how I see Churchill. I could have you know, read a whole lot of books, but I see this man who is usually shown stooped with a walking stick, his bowler hat, smoking a cigar, and being incapable of pronouncing Nazis properly. It was a Nazis. Uh, but that was a kind of symbolism at a time. And I want to take you through what Churchill and what he stands for still represents today. Because I would tend to you that there is no such thing as the ultimate truth in history. I'm old enough to be in certain subject on the third, fourth interpretation of whether something is good, bad or indifferent. We look at history at any given time and we look back at it through the prism of our time. And it is no good saying, you know, you, you mustn't do it. You do, because it is your means of making the present relevant. Whether it's just look back in your own life. You know, I don't know about you, but every time I smell lavender, I remember my grandmother. And the older I get, the different I see my grandmother. And by the point I became a grandmother myself, the notion of what it means to be a grandmother had changed. And when I actually hear Big Ben calling for a minute's silence on Remembrance Sunday, I remember the first time being told to hush, be quiet, and pause for a moment. These are all parts of the way we see history, and that is how I see the way we look at it. Sometimes history can be quite scary. The last time I was really scared, I was watch watching a Cathay Pacific uh, program on General Eisenhower when he did his first president, uh, and there was this, uh, this phrase in there where he said, let's go to North Korea, and I was going, oh my God, has, pre has Trump been watching this program? Um, so, you know, we, we look at this at any one time, but I tell you one thing. What I find absolutely extraordinary is why does the subject of Churchill simply not go away? When the last film came out, I really inwardly groaned and thought, what more is there to be said about the man? And yet, it was a great success. This tells us right now more about us than about Churchill, quite frankly. I think we're going through an extraordinary history where our obsession with the past, of whatever level of the past, shows a huge fear of the future. And we don't look at what we ought to be doing now and what we ought to be doing to tomorrow by trying to talk about the yesterday. And even though we know we can't do anything about the yesterday. So let's look about the today and where he could look for. First of all, Churchill, would he have survived the scrutiny of a modern press today? No, he wouldn't. Would uh, Roosevelt have survived the scrutiny of today? The American people didn't, largely didn't even realize he was in a wheelchair. British people didn't know Churchill had a stroke. 
You know, there, 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 there's a time and a place, and we still need leaders. And I would suggest to you that it does not bode well for the future if all our energy goes into knocking down everybody who's prepared to put the head above the parapet. And that is dangerous for the future of democracy. I found it deeply worrying, not yet, let me think whether I get there. I find it deeply worrying that we don't respect language. Did I really hear you say that Churchill's attitude to the Indians was the same as Hitler's to the Jews? No, you heard Leo Did, Amory say that. But we repeat this in here, if that is a fact. It is well, a fact, it's in the diary. Ladies, well, ladies and gentlemen, but there was an implication in this statement. The nope. implication was as an equation of values. Do not call people Nazis unless they actually did kill systematically five and a half million Jews in, in concentration camps and made it their aim to in, entirely eradicate people. Do not refer to the South African concentration camps as if they were the same of what happened during Hitler's time. And by the way, during Hitler's time, it also included Romanists, it included trade unionists, it included gay people, it included a whole lot of other things. So let's just be careful with your language. Because when we diminish language, we diminish the suffering and the extremes of bad things. I think if you want to only read one book to try and understand the world of Churchill, is to read his own book, My Early Life. He actually describes a cavalry charge. Unlike many politicians, and I include myself in them, who actually vote occasionally for war, who, who support our military services, this man actually describes what it really feels like to be in combat. We talk about it, but these experiences shape people. But there's also one sentence in there which I really want to quote to you. He says, the idea that nothing is true except what we comprehend is silly. And in that ideas which our minds cannot reconcile are mutually destructive, sillier still. I therefore adopt quite early in life a system of believing whatever I wanted to believe, while at the same time leaving reason to pursue unfettered whatever path she was capable of treading. And I'll tell you why this matters. Because it matters when you as a politician in a leading position, you're about to be absolutely defeated, have to give succor and courage to those around you, not show that you are just as scared as they are, actually be able to give some leadership to take them to places and to a brave level which they couldn't have done before. And he did that. Now, if this motion today had said, Churchill has as many faults as he had virtues, let's discuss. I would have said, let's discuss it. This room is full of people who tell me about all the things we don't know about Churchill. Actually, I do know about them, and we're talking about them. But I tell you one thing, I am not ashamed of a man who, if it hadn't been for him, I wouldn't be here today, and I would suggest that quite a few of you probably wouldn't be here either. So I am not only not ashamed of him, I am proud of him. Yeah, yeah.